Jesus and Melchizedek. Melchizedek first comes on the scene in Genesis 14. Jesus, of course, is a New Testament character, appearing in the Gospels. And how do they come together? Well, this passage in Hebrews 5, starting in verse 1, talks about the priests of the Old Testament. The book of Hebrews was written to Jewish Christians, so they were raised in a tradition of Levitical priests. First thing this passage does is explain what a priest is. Here's a picture of two priests. On the right is a cardinal, a Catholic priest. On the left is an Orthodox priest. Um, they tend to grow their beards quite long. So what is a priest? Well, according to our passage, they're human. On the right is a Buddhist, a Hindu holy man, um, a Hindu priest, and on the left is an Episcopal priest. So priests are human. In the Jewish tradition, they would be taken out of the Levitical tribe. It all started when uh, Aaron was pronounced to be the high priest, and the idea was that his sons and his grandsons and his great-grandsons would continue the line of priests. Uh, they got a bit off track, a bit evil, and so God chose other people, but all priests and the high priests and the Jewish people is always taken from the tribe of Levi, out of the Jewish people. Purpose of a priest. Uh, on the right is a, I think that's a Buddhist. I forget, I did this fast. A Buddhist priest, uh, we call them a monk. And on the left is uh, Martin Luther, probably the top uh, Lutheran priest there. So a priest stands between people and God. How this works is, you sin. God does not like sin. There is a priest who is a tad more holy than you. And so you could go and present confession. You could present sacrifice to the priest, and the priest would go and go to the Holy of Holies and present the sacrifice, present the gift to God, and you would receive forgiveness. You could not go anywhere near the Holy of Holies, which contained the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, so if you were living in ancient Israel and there was a tabernacle or there was a temple, you would probably never see the high priest because he would very early in the morning get consecrated, get holy, and to go out amongst the public would defile him. And so you would bring gifts and your lambs and your doves and they would go through many hands until the high priest could present them to God. And that priest would stand between you and your sin and God and his holiness. And he would bring the requests and he would bring the blessings. And a priest was necessary because of the sinfulness of people. So a priest offers gifts and sacrifices on your behalf. If you lived in ancient times, or if you're a Catholic, Catholics do that today. If you sin, you are not encouraged to confess directly to God. You're encouraged to go into a little room called a confessional and confess. And the priest who stands between you and God would then bring the forgiveness, would bring the blessings of God and the forgiveness from God. And so... We don't have priests. We are Baptists. Baptists tend to not have priests. I don't think there's a single Baptist denomination that has priests. There are Protestant denominations that have priests. Your Episcopals and Lutherans still ordained priests. Your Orthodox still ordained priests. But we have pastors. And the difference is, I believe I am just like you. And you are just like me. And so the word pastor means shepherd. And so I will stand with you 
I will stand next to you before the face of God because I am not holier, therefore you don't have to come to me and confess your sins. In fact, if you did, I'll tell you to stop because I don't want to know them. You give those directly to God. And we are all in the same group. There's nobody. The Catholics, for example, say off the stage is laity. On the stage is clergy, and up there somewhere is God, and that's the path you have to go. There are certain things clergy can do, there are certain things laity can do, but communicating directly with God, that is the job of the clergy. We as Protestant Baptists do not hold to that, and I will tell you why in a second. So why priests? Uh, on the left is a depiction of Aaron in the book of Leviticus. If you want to make your own high priest costume for Halloween, uh, you can do it. The pattern is right there in Leviticus, and it says make it look like that. Uh, colors, measurements, type of chain, type of stone, everything is down to the perfect detail because Aaron had to put that on sacrifice animals, be sprinkled with blood, and then go to the Holy of Holies. And if there was anything wrong with his uniform, down to a stitch, God would strike him dead. You can see, perhaps, at the bottom are bells. Because when the high priest went into the Holy of Holies, they wanted to hear the bells of him walking, because they knew if they stopped hearing the bells, something had gone wrong. So they also tied a rope around his leg so they could pull out his body if God was displeased. Very dangerous job being a high priest. Uh, on the right is one of the ayatollahs out of Iran. That is a Muslim priest, a Muslim mullah, a Muslim spiritual leader. Um, looks angry, if you ask me. But as I said, we don't have priests. Uh, we have pastors, and there's a common Baptist pastor, um, casual, you know, we just say it as it is, we don't fall on, on ceremony, we don't do the high church thing. A lot of your Baptist pastors are your teachers, and the goal is to lift you up, not put you down so that I am elevated, as can be with some priests. Uh, as I said, pastor means shepherd, it is a Greek word. And we stand with the people, not between the people and God. And that is the main difference between how we do church and how your Catholic and your Orthodox do church. Now back to the priests. Uh, the priests would offer sacrifices, and they would even do it for those who did not know or believe. If you read through the Old Testament, there was a central temple a central tabernacle. And Israel was fairly large. There could be, uh, you could be 150, 200 miles away from the temple. And if there was not the money to, trans to travel or you didn't have the ability to travel, the priest could still, way over there, do a sacrifice for your sin. Once a year on the Day of Atonement, the priest would sacrifice for the whole country of Israel, for all the Jews in the world. He would do a sacrifice to cover all of those sins. Now, I guarantee you there were some of those Jews who were a bit more wicked than others, a bit more not believing than others, yet the idea of the Old Testament priestly system is they could gain forgiveness if the priest remained righteous, the priest the priest as a federal representative of the people could gain forgiveness and so even though there was sin in the Jewish people they could continue generation after generation because there was a righteous high priest who was gaining the forgiveness high priests as I said were human are human and they understood human weakness because they're beset with weakness. They were able to understand the plight of the people because they were part of the people. And a 
lot of the high priests got very old, very up there in age, and as their bodies began to weaken, they could understand the weakness of the people. They had a sympathetic relationship because they were just like everybody else, but they were set apart. They were consecrated. They were made holy. And one problem with a human priest is that they have to sacrifice first for their own sin. Aaron had to get up early in the morning and get a sheep and sacrifice it for his own sin so that he could stand before God and get sacrifices for your sin. Because Aaron was born in sin. He was a sinful, evil person in God's sight because of selfishness and pride. And he had to get that cleaned up before he could stand in the Holy of Holies. And this made a, a multi-step process that was very dangerous that Aaron, as I said, didn't do the sacrifice right and didn't gain forgiveness for his own sins first, then God would not let him represent the people, and eventually they would go and get other priests. Aaron's sons, Nahab and Abihu, decided that they knew how to worship God in their own way, and so they got incense of their own formulation. And when they lit it up, God was displeased because it didn't follow the Levitical recipe. And he killed them. And Aaron's sons were destroyed. And the high priesthood was taken away from Aaron and given to another Levite. Because God says, I want it this way, this way, this way. Or you will not have your sins forgiven. And priests do not volunteer or apply. They are called, and in many ways they are drafted. Aaron had no choice. Um, he was drafted. And today we are a bit more relaxed with this. There are people who feel the desire to be a religious leader, and they will try to get into that work. And those people tend to go into more Protestant religions because you can't just show up at a Catholic church and say, I want to be a priest, and they'll let you in. Doesn't work that way. But it seems that if you want to be a more relaxed Protestant, you know, you're Baptist, you're Assemblies of God, you're Foursquare, you're, you're Protestant religions, um, anybody can start those types of churches in many ways. Uh, in California, we do plant 800 churches a year. Most of those are people who say, I want to start my own church and just go for it. After five years, three remain out of those 800. Uh, and I think that shows that a lot of people want to get into religious work because it makes them feel good and not because they're called. I was called on February 5th, 1984 uh, by God to do this work. And then for 21 years, he molded me into a person who could do it. And I became a pastor here back on March of 2005. And it wasn't, I had the opportunity to say no, I suppose, when they offered me the job, but I was definitely called, and it seemed like I was drafted. It seemed like it was definitely God's will uh, to put me here. So, why don't we have priests? As I've said, we are Baptists. Uh, we don't have priests. Uh, the question is, why? Well, according to Hebrews 5, we don't have priests because we got Jesus. Because Jesus is our priest. Uh, we have a priest, and he's Jesus. And he explains how Jesus fits the qualifications of a priest. First, he was appointed by the Father. If you read a lot about uh, how Jesus did what he did, He's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's crying, saying, don't do this, and God says, when you do this, Jesus, in many ways, even though he was obedient, was drafted. He was called, he was told by God the Father, do this, and his response was obedience, and yes, he will do it. But Jesus knew the price and knew what was going to happen, and in many ways, had no choice else he would not be the son of God. 
So Jesus is in the line of the priests. It says in Psalm 110.4, as was read in our passage, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek, as we remember, showed up in Genesis 14, shows up in Psalms 110.4, and then shows up several times in the book of Hebrews. Uh, he shows up, his name appears twice in Hebrews 5, and then there's a whole paragraph about Melchizedek in Hebrews 7, uh, which we will eventually get to. Just as a priest is sympathetic to your weakness because he's human, Jesus is sympathetic to our plight because he became flesh and walked among us. He experienced everything you experience, had the same emotions that you have, had the same challenges and temptations that you have. The Bible is clear that Jesus was tempted in every way that we are. Therefore, when you pray, Lord, save me from this temptation, he knows what you're talking about. Now, we say that God knows everything. That's true. God is omniscient, but God has not experienced everything. And I'm not saying that there's a major difference when it comes to God, but Jesus understands you in a way that he could not understand you if he never walked among us. And that is a sympathy that means he gets it. He gets it in a big way. And he prayed loud cries and tears. Prayed all the time in the Gospels. Prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Sweats dropped so big they were like drops of blood. So when you're in agony, when you're in a trauma, when you're praying through something, um, Jesus really gets it. He has prayed with that level of agony. And that is what this is trying to say, is that in your high church traditions, you come, you sit in the pew, there's clergy up here, you don't come near me, you know, don't touch me, you know, I'm talking to you, because I'm up here, and we think, does that priest really get what I'm going through, especially in your Catholic traditions, where the priests do not get married or have families, perhaps they don't understand the, the same struggles that families go through. And there can be a wonderment whether clergy today really understand what is going on, but we can be satisfied that Jesus Christ absolutely understands what's going on. He gets it. Then it says he learned obedience through suffering. Once again, Jesus doesn't necessarily have to learn because he knows everything. He's on a mission. But he hasn't experienced everything. And Jesus experienced obedience in a great and profound way. And so when God asks you to do a certain thing that is difficult, that is challenging, when God asks you to go through a situation that is catastrophic or traumatic, you can be sure that Jesus doesn't make those calls lightly, that he knows exactly what it is like to go through and suffer as a cost for obedience. He understands us. He gets us. And lastly, he provided a sacrifice for us. The priests of the Old Testament sacrificed a bird or a lamb for your sin. Jesus Christ sacrificed himself for our sin, and it is an eternal sacrifice for any who believe. So what do we do with this guy Melchizedek? Melchizedek, for some Jewish people, is kind of a folk hero. Uh, they don't know who he was. In Genesis 14, Lot, the a Abram's nephew, gets captured, and the five kings of the valley all come to war against Abram, and Abraham beats him. And right near the end of this, when he's making peace with the king of Sodom, before that city got wiped out, this guy just walks out in the middle of the desert. Says, Hi, I'm Melchizedek. I've got bread and wine. I am a priest of the God Most High, and I'm going to bless you. And Abraham seemed to say, Okay. 
and gave him an offering of all the stuff that he had gained. Gave him 10%, the first tithe that's in the Bible. Now, Melchizedek was a priest of the Most High God before anybody knew who the Most High God was. Abram was before Moses. Abram had to have Isaac and had to have kids and then boom, you get the 12 tribes and then they're in captivity in Egypt and then you got Moses. And so this is way early. And people have to wonder, how could he know who God is in a land of polygamy, in a land of multiple gods, in a land of nasty state-sanctioned sin? This guy just walks out, and we can imagine he was wearing some sort of priestly robes and a long beard, I guess. And he says, I am the priest of the Most High God. And Abraham, because he had talked with God about this move into the Promised Land, connected with him. And then he disappeared. We don't see his name until Psalms 110. And we don't see an explanation of who he is until Hebrews 5 and 7. But his name means King of Righteousness, Melchizedek. And his title is the King of Salem or the King of Peace. Uh, some people say that he was the King of Jerusalem, Jerusalem, City of Peace. Um, no real evidence of that. Uh, but some people wonder if he's even real. Some people say he was a pre existent Christ. Uh, which would make it weird to be in the line of the high priest of yourself, which is what it says in Hebrews. But as I said, he's a folk hero that lots of lore has been created about, and we will look about him, look at him more in Hebrews 7. But what God is saying here is he is saying the worship of himself, the worship of the Most High God, goes way back before the law, way back before Moses, and Jesus is our priest in the same line that goes way back to the beginning. Jesus has been a priest of the Most High God for eternity. So if we think that we don't have the power or the access or the knowledge or the understanding or all the stuff we get in worshiping Jesus, what this passage is saying is you have all that and more, that Jesus Christ gets it, that he stands between you and God the Father, that your sins are taken care of. And we know for a fact that when we stand before God at the end of time, God will look at us and see the sacrifice of Jesus. And we will be allowed into heaven for all eternity because of what Jesus Christ did not because of anything we did, not because of any human sacrifice, not because of any lamb sacrifice, but because of what Jesus Christ did. Let us pray. Lord God, we just praise you. We praise you that you are our high priest, that you hear our prayers, that you make intercession for us, that you are someone who understands. And Lord, we just praise you for being our priest today, for being our Lord, and for being our God. And pray that we will continue to lift you up and walk in a way that pleases you. Lord, we praise you for all these things.